Welcome to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com, dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. Serving leaders, managers, and people who will be, helping you reach excellence in your work and achieve your personal goals at the same time. Sign up for the free course at clearandopen.com. In order to make a case that there's no such thing as self-interest, you have to be able to make the case that human beings, adults, are not always a choice. Because as long as you're choosing to do something, you're choosing to do it because of your values. And if you're choosing to do something because of your values, you served yourself. Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for tuning in to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com. Contrary to popular belief, the younger generation of employees isn't necessarily worse or as different as you might think they are. Instead, they have an enviable sense of self-interest. In this episode, we'll discuss why there's no such thing as a selfless act and the distinctions between self-serving in a healthy way and greed. Plus, we'll also take a look back in history as to where our views on sacrifice and greed really come from, and why there's no word in nearly any language to discuss the positive and healthy aspects of them. This is a game-changing way of looking at the world that will affect not only your management style, but your perception of every charitable act you've ever seen. Keep listening to learn more. This episode is from a recent weekly member webcast. Members get a ton of different ways to become better professionals, including attendance to the live courses that I teach. Beginning January 11, 2018, which is right around the corner, I'll be teaching an 11-week course called How to Manage and Be Managed, The Missing Manual. You know, management is like parenting. Many people do it, and they mostly have no idea what they're doing, but they somehow make it work. The result? Stress, wheel spinning, overwhelm, and millions of dollars conservatively lost in opportunity. This course is the missing manual, what we all should have been taught in high school. Forget everything you've learned about management. You don't have to motivate your employees. You don't need to empower them, and you definitely shouldn't be supervising them. This course trains you in the basics of the clear and open model for management. Increase engagement and productivity. It eliminates supervision and wasted resources. This is a counterintuitive approach that I've been training leaders in one-on-one for over 15 years, now offered for the first time as a very affordable course. And while the course is about training management skill, it's also very appropriate for non-managers because it gives employees what they need to understand what a manager is doing with them and why it's in their best interest interest to help and cooperate. For more information about the course, please go to clearandopen.com slash how dash to dash manage. Clearandopen.com slash how to manage with some dashes. All right. Thanks so much for listening. Let's get into the podcast. Killer question, Linda. Why are employees so much, what was the word you used? So much more what than they used to be? So much worse than they used to be. I mean, we never had these problems that we have now. Are they this younger? Is it the younger generations you're experiencing? The younger generation, that mostly, yeah. Mm. Well, we could talk for an hour about that. Maybe we will. Do a whole day on that. Does any, yeah. Does anybody know why? Spoiled. <laughs> No uh, mystery. Has anybody agree? Have that experience? Some of you aren't old enough to know how it used to be. Some of you aren't old enough to remember before there were answering machines. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking yesterday. I wanted to. I wanted to tweet or something. I remember vividly learning how to write an at symbol when email came out. And somebody was like, "And there's an at." I'm like, "An at?" You know over the number two. And I was, had to learn how to write the at symbol because one never learned. You don't learn that when you write the alphabet. Now kids today, I'm sure are writing their first ats not long after they write their name because their email address probably has their name and the at symbol in it. Times have changed. Okay. Why are employees different than they used to be? There's a lot of talk about this in the world. The answer to the question is that Without going into the why, because that's a story and can't be really absolutely understood into the theoretical and the abstract, the younger generations have an inviolable sense of self-interest. 
We haven't talked about, have we talked about the principle of self, self-interest in this group? All right, so here's the shortcut. Let's start with that. I know Scott knows what I'm talking about. He's heard it in the other groups. Is there such a thing as selflessness? Can you give an example of a selfless act? I promise this may seem abstract, but this will come back around to the younger generations. What's an example of a selfless act? Taking care of a child. Okay. Your child? Yes. So do you have any interest in that child, you know, surviving? Definitely. Not self, uh, then there's the self-interest, right? It's your child. Right. So it's not to say that there isn't service. There is such a thing as service, of course. But the principle of self-interest asserts that every service has a self-interested motive there somewhere. You take care of your children. Now, is taking care of children a huge amount of work? Absolutely. Quite possibly the most difficult job in the world. Does that mean you're sacrificing your own needs? You chose to have the child. And even if it were an accident, you choose to continue to take care of the child. You don't have to do that. Other examples of selfless acts? What about a guy runs into a burning building to save a crying child, dies in the process? Is that selfless? He wanted to save a life. Unfortunately, his life was taken away, but he was doing a humanity way. So where's his self-interest operating there? You said when you say the phrase he wanted, that's the trail. He wanted to do it. He Um, he didn't care if he was going to survive or not. Yes. He chose to make that baby's life more important than his. His values in that moment was this child's life is more important than mine. I'm going to choose to act according to my values. That's the self-interest. I get to choose to act according to my values. Now, notice if you feel any contraction like that says, well, but that's so noble, but that's so courageous. Nobody's saying it's not noble or courageous. Nobody's saying it's not an enormously amazing act of service doesn't take away from that. Just because you get something out of giving away every cent and every possession in your life to charity, which here's another example, you get something out of that. You get to live according to your values. You know what? I don't want all this stuff. I think these people would be better served with it. I'm giving away everything and I'm going to go live under a bridge. You chose to do it. See, the thing is, in order to make a case that there's no such thing as self-interest, you have to be able to make the case that human beings, adults, are not always a choice. Because as long as you're choosing to do something, you're choosing to do it because of your values. And if you're choosing to do something because of your values, you served yourself. In what way does this seem significant? I think because the younger generation, that's all they care about is what What's in it for them? Yes. And what's great about that? Uh, that. (laughs) That's the secret. That's the secret. Linda, I hope you heard that. Until you can celebrate what's great about that, you will be in resistance to it. So what's going on is former work generations, former generations of people, for thousands and thousands of years, have been okay pretending that there's such a thing as selflessness. Notice how many people, maybe you're one of them, uses the word sacrifice to describe what you do for your children or what you do for your boss or what you do for your company. Where's the sacrifice? Do you know where the term sacrifice comes from, anthropologically speaking? Sacrifice came from, it's the same root as sacred. Sacrifice came from long time ago. Well, in some places they probably still do it. But, you know, like if your crops were suffering and you needed rain, you would kill one of your goats for a god in an offering to try to get it to rain. That's a deal. You see, 
I'm going to give you this goat in exchange. I want you to give me the rain. It's somewhere over the history of consciousness. It's on my would love to do if I had more time uh, research projects. Where did it go from being a deal to selflessness? Now, again, is there's a risk there, right? In the, the, the tribal elder who kills the goat, it's, it's, it's a leap of faith in a way. There's a surrender there. There's a nobility to that. There's a surrender to, I can't control the rain. My life is in your hands. I'm going to give you this goat. Hopefully you'll give me something in exchange. Now that's courageous and noble, but selfless. The aspect of selflessness that is there is the surrender of, I can't control this. You're greater than I am. I can't make it rain. So you can see how that would be understood in a kind of broad brush way, in a kind of unsophisticated way. Oh, well, they're being selfless. No, they're not. The self-interest is completely active there. They're giving up the goat in hope of a return. See, it just requires a little bit of a fine distinction. But our whole world is screwed up because of the absence of these kinds of fine distinctions. So someone interpret that as like, oh, well, you get you know, gifts from gods when you are selfless. So we better do that. And so it went on and on and on and on. What's one of the most classic selfless stories that exists in our world culture? that has over a billion subscribers to the story for 500 points. The Bible? Yes. Which part? There's a specific selfless act in the New Testament. The only thing I'm thinking of is when um, the two women with the child went in front of one of the pharaohs. And um, they was going to divide the child in half. And, and one lady who really was the mother said, no, take the child. Where's the selflessness there? She's giving up everything for his life. What did she give up? She gave up the baby, her own baby. And the self-interest acting was? No self-interest. Really? Well, that, this, you're purporting this is an exception to the rule. She said, I'll give up the child. Just don't cut it in half. It's fascinating, by the way. There's the same story in, uh, in Zen about a cat, two monks over a cat. It's, uh, it's a great story, right? And then what, what happens? Then, then the mother gets the baby, right? Because she proves how much she loves and blah, blah, blah. Right. So right. Where's, the, where, where's the self-interest in that story? Self-interest? It was her own baby, but she... She made a choice. I would rather have my baby live instead of and give it up rather than have it die. Right. There's the self-interest. See how simple that is. Yet most people will look at that and go, oh, wow, what sacrifice, what selflessness. There's nothing selfless about it. It's choice. Noble. Yes. Brave. Yes. Difficult. Sure. But there's a self there making a choice. The ultimate New Testament selfless act I would offer is the crucifixion, right? Jesus died for your sins, many of the Christians say. But this was at the ultimate sacrifice. Was it? Was, did Jesus have self-interest in letting himself be crucified? Did he know in advance it was going to happen, according to the story? He did. Uh-huh. So didn't do anything to avert it? No, he knew it was his fate. And chose to live according to it. Correct. What was his self-interest? At the very least. He knew it was his fate. So the choice was what? He just wanted to do what was good for everyone. Yeah. Because that was his values. Right. To abide with what his sense of his fate was. There's even a moment, I forget exactly where, there's a moment where he, he's talking with God and he's basically saying, if there's any other way for this to play out, like that'd be great. But 
if this is what has to happen, this is what has to happen, right? He chooses. He's got self-interest in there. Does that make it any less noble or again, yada, yada? No. So why is it that we have this feeling that self-interest is bad? That's really the question now. So if self-interest is in everything, why is it that we have this notion that self-interest is such so bad? There's a degree to which self-interest is good. I mean, it's, they have self-interest for everything. I mean, everything is all about them. It's not, you know. Who's that? For anyone else. All these young people, they don't look out for anyone else. They look out for themselves. They don't do anything for anyone else. They do it for themselves. Well, now, hold on. Is that, that you're making a, quite an absolute statement. They don't well, do anything for anyone else ever? Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. So now we need another distinction. So the word we have for meeting your own needs unhealthily is selfish, right? That's what selfish means. Selfish means when you do something that's just about you and in an unhealthy way that maybe impinges on the rights of others or whatever, that's selfish. What's the word we have for when you serve your own needs in a healthy way? What do you call that? Unselfish. <laughs> no, that's different. That's like generous. Good guess though. Nobody's ever said that before. This is like the 500th time I've had this conversation. I should finally record it and just hit, hit play. But it's There's so not much a word for it. There's not a word for it. What does that tell you? I offer it means either of two things. It either means that serving one's own needs is in fact a bad thing such that we don't even have a word for it or we're so screwed up as an entire species about the idea of self-interest that we don't even have a word for something that we do every day. You brush your teeth, you make sure you get enough food, you keep the right amount of clothing on your back, you get enough sleep. All of this is healthy self-interest. If somebody attacks you, you defend yourself. This is all healthy self-interest, yet we don't even have a word for it. Every time I meet someone who speaks a new language to me, I ask them this question. What's the word you have for it? Portuguese, Farsi, Hindu, Japanese, Mandarin, Russian, Ukrainian, Italian, French, Spanish. I've, I've asked everyone. There's no freaking word for it. Does this strike you as a little bit odd? We don't have a word for something that is our adult responsibility to embody on a daily basis. To take care of yourself in a healthy, self-interested way. There's no word. There's no word. The reason for this goes back a really long way. It goes back to the times where in uh, as soon as the first people figured out how to create decent weapons, it's like Bronze Age stuff, someone made a very crude iron weapon. And they, you know, they were in a hunter-gatherer society. And they looked at the weapon in their hand and they said, well, now that I have this, I could spend all day foraging for food and hunting, which is a lot of work. Or I could wait to the end of the day and then just hit, you know, Bob over there over the head with this thing and take their stuff. That would be a lot easier. And so they did. And then other people saw, hey, look what Johnny over there is doing with that sword thing he made. I'll make one too. And so it went. And the first prophet, Zoroaster, the story goes, basically said, whoa, 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 guys, this is no good. Everybody's in constant fear of each other. We can't get along this way. That's not good. You should stop doing that. You're operating from self-interest. Now, this was like, I don't know, uh, it's, it's, I forget, seven to 9,000 years ago, somewhere back then. So they failed to make the distinction between greed, unhealthy self-interest, and healthy self-interest. And they just said, look, serving yourself like that, that's bad. But nobody made the distinction that there was a difference between healthy self-interest and unhealthy self-interest. 
such that even today we don't have a word for it. Now, I'm making it sound really simple, but if you're not appreciating that this is a game-changing way of looking at the world, that it would change absolutely everything in our world, you're not understanding what I'm saying. This distinction has the power to radically transform the world because there are literally billions of people going through their lives without a notion or an embodiment of healthy self-interest. There are billions of people who think their path to salvation, enlightenment, self-actualization, success is serving others ahead of themselves. We start to hear it every uh, November, right? The gift of giving. Giving is better than receiving. There it is. Is that true? Is giving better than receiving? Not if you get something out of the giving, which you do. You see, every giving is a receiving. Oh no, it's selfless. It's no, it's not. It just, when somebody does something that's selfless, what's actually going, or that they think is selfless, what's actually going on is they're just in denial of what they're getting out of it. What's wrong with giving this something to someone and getting something from the act? What's wrong with your heart filling with joy and serving someone else? What's wrong with that? You see, you can't answer the question. Because it's just been conditioned into us for thousands of years that self-interest is bad. YouTube, the speech from Wall Street, where Michael Douglas, the famous greed is good speech. This is one of the most misunderstood speeches ever. He's talking about healthy self-interest. When people think about that scene, they think greed is good. Oh, yeah, that's the whole corporate machine. No, that's not what he's talking about at all. He just doesn't have, he doesn't, if you replace greed with healthy self-interest, then the whole speech makes perfect sense. But greed is unhealthy self-interest. He's speaking to, he, he talks about how greed actually drives progress and change. But he's talking about the good side of greed. It's confusing because greed is, uh, we automatically associate as being negative. But that's what greed is good is about. And Ayn Rand, um, Atlas Shrugged and Fountainhead, all of Ayn Rand's novels have the same kind of thing. She's showing what self-interest, healthy self-interest is about. She's one of the very few philosophers who actually championed it. Thanks for listening to Manage to Engage, the clear and open podcast. Join us next week when you'll be a little bit closer to who you're destined to be. Until then, know that Clear and Open is dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. Be sure to visit clearandopen.com for the latest tools, articles, and free resources to help you on your journey. Thanks for listening and bye for now.